everybody. I'm Jean Chatsky. Welcome to Your Money Map, sponsored by the Alliance for Lifetime Income, and an episode that we've intriguingly it titled, What Economists Know That Your Financial Advisor May Not. It's interesting, over, over many years of reporting both with financial advisors, some of the smartest in the country, and economists, some of the smartest in the country, one of the things that I've learned is that they have a very different perspective on things, a very different perspective on how humans do, but also should use the resources, i.e. the money that we have, save, invest, spend, protect, um, they wear different glasses and, and they, they look through those glasses in order to come up with opinions on all of the various decisions that we make. And my guest today is one of those leading economists. Larry Kotlikoff is someone that I have called so often for advice and for um, comments over the years. Best-selling author many times over. His new book is called Money Magic, but he's also written Maxing Out Your Social Security, Maxing Out, um, he's written on Medicare and he's a columnist for, among other places, The Hill, The Financial Times, The Washington Post, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times. Larry, welcome. It's so nice to see you. Uh, great to be with you again, Jean. Really a lot of fun. So before we dive into our, our topic of the day and talk a little bit about um, the different perspectives that an economist has and how we can grab a little of your money magic and apply it to our portfolio, um, I first want to remind everybody who's watching us on LinkedIn and on Facebook that this is intended to be a conversation in which you participate. So please um, ask questions. Uh, write us some comments. I will happily weave them into the conversation. And and Larry is never short on advice and opinion, so he will be happy to weigh in as well. Um, we're in the middle of some tumultuous uh, times on the global stage um, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, the markets have been volatile. Um, as, a, as you look at our money, Larry, as you look at our personal finances, as you look at the ups and downs in the market, mm -hmm. and add in the fact that we're dealing with inflation um, at its highest level in 40 years, we're dealing with a Federal Reserve that's going to be raising interest rates, we're not quite done with this pandemic. Um, how do you think um, that human beings who are pretty emotional when it comes to all of these things should be um, should be viewing these events and should be reacting or not. Well, you know, we've had a pretty bumpy ride for quite a couple decades with the 2008 crisis and then uh, COVID um, and the markets have gone up and down a lot. You know, we had a 53% drop in the stock market in, in 2008 to 2009 and went down 34% at the beginning of COVID. And the Fed came in and rescued things. Interestingly, the the rescue of the stock market worked recently, but it didn't work back in 2008, uh, even though the Fed intervened quite a bit and the Treasury. So there's no guarantee. Now we've got Putin invading Russia, uh, I mean, sorry, Ukraine, and uh, the possibility at the, in the extreme of a World War III. I mean, it's not completely out of the question. We've got U.S. troops going into the Baltics. Putin is saying, more or less any place that used to have Russians, we want to take back. And the Baltics had a lot of Russians. They still do, uh, native speaking Russians. So, so I would say there's risk. And what economics says, which is not widely known, is that you should time the market for risk because the stock market is going to be more volatile in risky times. And what you want to do is move uh, out of uh, somewhat out of stocks into safer securities during risky times because, uh, you know, that's basically what we're trying to do. When we diversify, we're trying to get a balance between risky and safe assets and our risk aversion, but the riskiness of, these, of the risky assets matters. And when the risky assets become riskier, 
you want to uh, reallocate. So we want to time the market for risk, not for return. In other words, we shouldn't um, think that uh, the market's high and therefore it's going to go down or the market's low and therefore it's going to go up for sure. We economists uh, don't see that in the data. Uh, the market tends to be a random walk. Um, but when it gets riskier, then we should um, pull out a bit. Gene? Did people moving to treasuries, people moving to, um, uh, to, to treasury bonds and other, other safe so-called investments. Um, and yet right now it's, it's been, um, it's been very difficult to make any money to get any sort of return in those sorts of investments. So, so what do you, what is your advice this time around any different? Well, I think, um, so inflation is also a big risk in this in this setting. So one thing we want to do is, uh, you know, in terms of getting a high return, if you can pay off uh, high interest uh, debts, uh, like a student loan, like a credit card bill, those are things you should go right after. And, and uh, you know, once you've gotten your employer match at, at the job, then take any extra money you'd be contributing to your 401k and pay it. Use it to pay off your credit card uh, bills if you're running, uh, you know, a balance there where you're being charged 18% or a student loan where you're being charged maybe 7% because you took it out in the past when rates were high. Uh, on the other hand, if you have, if you can borrow, maybe maintain a mortgage that's a low interest rate or refinance your mortgage at what are still low rates, relatively low rates historically, or take out an even bigger mortgage and then take the proceeds, the extra money from borrowing and buying inflation index, inflation index bonds, or even better, I bonds, but then you're limited to only 10,000 per person in the household per year. But anyway, uh, th that's a hedge against inflation. We have to be very concerned about an inflation risk. So it's not just protecting us by you know being less exposed to risky securities, but we also wanna try and actively find ways to insure ourselves against particular economic risk. And inflation is a terrible risk so if we're holding cash, you know, we're, we lost seven and a half percent in real terms from just holding cash over the last year because maybe we were concerned the stock market was overvalued, which it kind of seems to be. So, one, you know, if you borrowed money and put it in inflation index bonds, inflation takes where to take off, go even higher than the seven percent, seven and a half percent we saw uh, from January last to last January to the prior January, then uh, you're going to win on two sides because well, you're going to win on one side. The mortgage you'll repay in uh, water down dollars, but the inflation index bonds will be protected against inflation. So now inflation index bonds are subject to taxation mm -hmm. the, and the nominal interest uh, is being taxed, not the real interest. So with higher inflation, you get a higher tax bite. But it's so it's not a particularly, you know, completely safe, no, not a completely cheap or free insurance move. But it is a good move uh, in these risky times with respect to in inflation. I expect to see higher inflation in the future, not lower, because the country is so broke. You might think that's crazy because the markets are predicting a pretty quick drop in inflation rates uh, in terms of if you look at the term structure of nominal interest rates and, and inflation index bond rates, uh, which are called TIPS, Treasury Protect and Inflation Protected Securities, as you know. Uh, the differential is really telling us about projected inflation, and that's projected to come down pretty quickly. But what's not being, I think, widely understood is how broke the country is and how the the increase in prices is really reflecting the fiscal imbalance, the, the fact that the Fed's printing money to pay bills uh, that the government would otherwise be paying with taxes. We, we have this you know, long-term structural imbalance between our taxes being down here and our spending being up there. And... Uh, and there's no appetite by Congress to fix that. So printing money is what countries that are going broke do and to pay their bills. And that shows up in inflation, ultimately at hyperinflation. I would be worried about that. Okay. Because my job, and, economy, my job as an economist is to worry about the downside, not to focus on the upside, but to, to be the dismal economist and, and worry, protect people against the downside. I was going to say, that's why they call you the dismal scientist. Correct. Yeah, exactly. um, 
you wrote the book, uh, and let's dive into the book a bit. Um, you wrote the book because uh, there's a difference between personal finance and economics. There's a difference between personal finance and investing. And I know you you sort of laid it out in in four steps for four main differences that we need to be focused on. And so I'd, I'd like to go through those. As yeah. you as you start looking at the, the difference between your um, your personal finances and, and how an economist might look at them, take me through the four steps. Sure. The, the economics, uh, you know, so my book, Money Magic, which is, just came out in January, which you're so kind to, you know, to talk about here um, and in other settings, uh, is about the fact that economics has been studying personal finance for a century. And nobody's been really conveying to the public what economics has to say about our financial moves. So in that sense, you know, learning about things that we think are can be can be helpful is like magical. Uh and that's why that's where the the title came from, Money Magic. So, uh, so the four uh, aspects of personal finance, economics based personal personal finance, are first of all look at your resources and then figure out a sustainable spending level. The goal is to have uh, acorns to eat in the winter and in the summer, in the spring, and the fall, just like a squirrel. You want to be able to have uh, the same living standard in retirement that you had before retirement. That's our basic goal. You might want to have your living standard drop a little bit uh, because you may not make it to your you know, maximum age of life, which is really your proper planning horizon because you might live that long. You have to plan to possibly live that long. But you want to basically have a smooth living standard. Then you want to find safe ways to raise it. That's step two. Wait, before you move on, let me dig into step one, Larry, because because I, I actually want to get into these and I want to understand how okay. we do that. Um, if you're talking about figuring out a standard of living that will um, sustain you through through your working life into your retirement life, I mean that that sounds pretty good actually. That you wouldn't have to take a, a step back in how you're living. I, I would like to think that in my retirement, I would be able to eat out as much as I eat out now, and shop as much as I eat tra- shop now, and travel. I'd actually like to travel more in my retirement than I, than I travel now. Um, but I also worry that some of my costs, costs maybe out of my control, like healthcare might go up. So, right. so talk to me, talk to me about how you accomplish step one. So uh, I, you can do it with arithmetic or you could do it with our, my company. I have a software company on the side. I'm a, you know, BU professor full time, but I do have started a company 29 years ago that has a tool called maxify.com, which helps people do this. But just with arithmetic, since the real returns right now are safe, real returns are zero, we can just do the following. We can add up all our labor income up to our retirement age. Uh, uh, we, we got we went dark because the room let me just turn the light back on, okay? Okay, guys, this is this is this is what happens when you go live on Facebook. This is this is live TV. I, I uh, at one point I had an experience on the Today Show where um, I was sitting across from Bryant Gumbel, and he got a cramp in his leg, and he said to me, "We were in a commercial break, just telling a story here, Larry. We were in a commercial break, and he said to me." You know, I've got a, I've got a cramp. It was like a Charlie horse kind of a cramp. He said, if I leave, you just keep going. You just keep talking. They, they'll take the camera off me and they'll look at you. Well, we couldn't do that at this point, but, but you get the idea. Okay. Glad, yeah. glad yeah. to see the lights are still working there. So, okay. So let's take your, um, your human wealth, your labor earnings. Now you can basically just add those up to a conservative, uh, uh expected date of retirement. So now that's your lifetime, uh, labor, you know, what we, what economists call human wealth. Now I'll take your net wealth, your, uh, you know, your checking accounts, savings accounts, subtract off your debts, uh, add your retirement account uh, assets. Uh, you have to then figure out some idea of what your taxes are going to be. This is where the software is really very good at figuring this out for you. But you can, you know, think about some kind of tax rate that's going to be applied. And then, so you want to subtract off um, a percentage of that, of those resources as a, uh, and now you're with your net resources, but then you want to take off, subtract off your off the top expenses like 
maybe special trips, maybe, you know, paying off your housing costs. If you're going to, let's say, keep your house uh, till the end, uh, you want to pay, for, you want to think about all the property tax, uh, tax you're going to be paying, add those all up, the maintenance costs, the insurance costs, the mortgage costs. Now you've got your net spendable resources and that's your lifetime spending. Now you want to just divide by the number of person years left in your household. So if you've got, you know, you and your husband have potentially could live the two of you for 80 years, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're let's 60 help. and he could, you could live to hundred he could live to hundred. So now that's 80 years. If you had any kids at home, that might be adding some other uh, uh, years of uh, people in your household. And then you just divide the net spendable resources by the number of uh, person years. And you've got the amount to be spent per person per year. And that's, and then you multiply by the number of people in the household that year and that gives you your uh, annual spending. And now you know your income, subtract the annual spending, you know how much you should be saving. So it actually is pretty simple. It really just requires high school algebra. To get well, a pretty good well, what do you do about those uncontrollable costs toward the, ends of, toward the end of life? What do you do about the fact well, that you think you might want some additional income at the end of life? Well, you would, uh, okay, so if you wanna have, uh, uh, I would put those in as kind of the housing or the healthcare costs. I would put those in as a special expense and treat that as like a negative, like a paying taxes. So that reduces your spendable. We're talking about your discretionary spending uh, budget, lifetime budget, and figuring out how much you can do spend of that per year. So things that are kind of off the top that you're going to have to spend for, like extra out-of-pocket healthcare costs, and you want to be conservative you subtract those before you do the division and then you figure out the discretion. So it's really the discretionary spending we want to look the the fixed costs that we have to do like housing, like, uh, you know, that's just fixed. So we really want to deal with our discretionary spending where we have the choice either to spend or save uh, out of, you know, what's left in terms of our um, spending power. Okay. All right. So take me to step two. We, we've got our, we've got how much we can spend each year. What's the second thing we need to focus on? So now we want to figure out safe ways to raise our living standards. So if you're, uh, you know, the book is really trying to focus on people at every age. So I, you know, one chapter is um, don't borrow for college. And I talk about ways of not getting yourself in hock going to college uh, and and how expensive and how risky it is to borrow for college. So I'm really adamant not that people should not be borrowing anything at all if they can avoid it to go to college. Then there's another chapter on my daughter, the plumber, the fact that you can be a plumber and make more than a doctor these days on a lifetime basis. You know, you have the Alliance for Lifetime Income, right? So we wanna make sure that our career choice is gonna give us the highest lifetime uh, earnings. Uh, and that may require a little more research than, or, and a little more thinking about whether we wanna be one of the you know, 30% of the people that get college degrees, not all of whom make it rich, or one of the 70% of our kids who don't get college degrees, and many of whom end up a lot better off because of not having gone that route. Like well, let me let me push back on that for a second yeah. because okay. uh, you're you're a professor at Boston University. I know you went to my alma mater, the University of Pennsylvania. Neither of those schools are inexpensive. Um, there's a lot of research that shows that you know that graduating from college um, does translate into uh, a higher lifetime income. How how do you balance that with the fact that many people have not put away money for college. Many people can't afford to go without borrowing. Well, um, a couple of things. Uh, you know, there's there's been studies by economists that look at how much value added a place like Harvard would give you uh, in the in terms of your lifetime earnings. It turns out to be essentially nothing. Uh, it turns out that Harvard is collecting very hardworking, very creative kids and of course, lots of kids who are very hardworking, very creative, can't get in because there's so many people applying to Harvard. Uh, but if you're creative and hardworking, you can make it. And you're going to make it whether you go to Wake Forest or Harvard. It's Harvard is just collecting people. They might, you know, so that Harvard sweater that you're going to wear in the summer to your first, second, third job will probably get you fired by the fourth job because people will be sick of seeing it. <laughs> uh, I, I went to Harvard, so I'm, you know, nothing especially negative against Harvard. 
and I got my PhD there. So, um, but the ones who succeeded in my graduate class were the ones who worked hard, not the smartest, not the uh, the ones who actually, actually had some some discipline. So, you know, I give an example of um, what if you wanted to get a job in quantum computing at IBM after four years of college, and you went to your local community college for six thousand a year in Wyoming, rather than go to some place where you had to borrow in the end, you know, two hundred thousand dollars. Okay, and so you take online courses, suppose for for grades, for certificates from twenty different top schools. Stanford has online courses like this. They're very cheap. Harvard, Boston University, every top university has these cheap online courses. Now you go to IBM when you graduate with no debt and you say, look, I've got 20 certificates here. I got A's in all these courses in quantum computing. Do you want to hire me or do you want to hire the graduate from Williams who's a graduate in English, got a better degree, more prestigious uh, university than Podunk U that I went to, but he doesn't have these certificates. He doesn't know anything about quantum computing. IBM is going to hire you. So I think we, we also have to realize that 40%, two out of five kids who start college don't graduate. Mm-hmm. So if you're borrowing for the privilege of flunking out of college, this is nuts. Why would, you, why would anybody borrow when the chance of the return on the investment that you're going to borrow the money to invest in is right off the bat, 20, 40% chance of losing everything. This is extremely risky, and it's being, you know, fully uh, pushed by the federal government. Almost everybody's borrowing from the federal government at very high rates. You can't get out from under these loans. You can't discharge them in bankruptcy. They will take your, they will garnish your Social Security benefits when you're 90 to repay your student loans. They will. I've seen this happen. So it's it's uh, this is a modern day debtors debtors prison is student loans, so I would avoid it. But then there's other. You know, what else can we do in order to safely raise our living standard? Well, I know that you, I know that you had an experience, um, and and maybe this is more maybe this comes later in the curve. But I I know that you had an experience with your mother, um, where uh, you wanted to get her some additional income for her later years and you look to one of the products that we talk about a lot on this show which is an annuity yeah so there are really you know a ton of different ways to safely raise you know, a ton of magic tricks to raise your living standard at all ages of your lifespan before you start investing money risky and you know at risk in the stock market if you think that's your your way to riches well let's first of all take the low-hanging fruit and make sure you use it so in my mom's case she was 88 and uh, not in the, in the best of health, but fully, you know, uh, cognizant, lots of fun. Um, we were, you know, but my brother, and, so I came to my brother and sister, look, mom's not in great health. She's going to need more help through time. It's going to be very expensive. Let's buy her an, an annuity. And uh, at the time, the uh, principal insurance company was selling inflation index annuities. So my brother, who's the provost of Cornell, he's my twin brother. I like to give him a hard time because that's what twin brothers do. Uh, <laughs> he, he thought this was crazy um, because he said, mom's life, you know, we love mom, but her life expectancy is only four years. And my sister, who was like running major U.S. companies uh, in her day, she's a couple of years older than us, um, said she, she sided with my brother. And I said, no, <laughs> sorry, we're going to do this because uh, the real risk is not that she would pass away the financial risk is really uh, that she lives to 100 uh, because then we're going to have these very high costs and the annuity will keep us insured, protected against that because the money will keep coming in and it'll be inflation protected. So uh, we bought the annuity. My mom ended up living to 98. Uh, and you know we, we saved a lot of um, money for ourselves because we did that. That was a, a really um, a good move. And um, I get to rub it into my brother and sister all the time. So it even was always, here, always a good thing. I mean, the know, other, another that. way to to do that to to make sure that your income uh, uh, grows is to delay Social Security, right? I mean, Social yeah, so Security yeah. is an index is an is an inflation protected annuity. Can you can you talk about that? Yeah, if you wait till 70, rather than, if you take your Social Security 62 versus 70, uh, you're giving up an enormous gain in uh, in benefits 
uh, inflation adjusted. The, the benefit at 70 is 76% higher, 76% higher adjusted for inflation than at 62. So if you give up eight years of low benefits and then start getting the 76% higher number, the benefits you gave up was really the payment for getting this higher stream, which is you're in effect buying an annuity with giving up those benefits, but it's an inflation index annuity. So this is an incredibly cheap way of buying inflation protected. When we have seven and a half percent inflation raging, we want to get more of our resources in inflation protected form. So definitely everybody should be very careful about taking Social Security too early. That's an extremely important money magic trick. Uh, so there's a chapter about my 10 top secrets uh, to maximizing your lifetime benefits uh, in the book. The Now going back to uh, buying an annuity for my mom today when there's no inflation protected annuity to buy, I think what I would do is take out a bigger mortgage on uh, on our house, uh, buy, you know, borrow money uh, at the current rates, which are still relatively low, and use that to buy an annuity for her were she alive today. Because if inflation takes off, I would lose on the annuity because it's not inflation protected, but I would win on the mortgage because I'd be paying back the mortgage in inflation uh, and watered down dollars. So you can build a hedge this way against inflation. That's another trick that's in the book, uh, how, to, how to kind of roll your own inflation indexed annuities. Um, I, I took you through steps one and two. Can you take me through three and four quickly? Yeah, th three is uh, pricing decisions, like lifestyle decisions. Like if I'm thinking about, gee, uh, should I move from um, uh, Connecticut in my maybe expensive home for my kids have left. I've got a four bedroom house it's, and uh, I can sell for a bundle, move to Texas, but I'm going to have to give up my uh, all my friends around the neighborhood. Uh, and uh, but Texas has got no income tax. Uh, Texas has got lower cost of living in many ways, more higher property tax, perhaps. But but I can buy, downsize my home in the same at the same time. So this can be an enormous increase in my uh, spendable, my discretionary spending an enormous money uh, trick. Now, uh, yeah, so I have to see how much my living standard, my sustainable living standard will go up at the cost of not seeing my friends all the time. On the other hand, if I save all this money, I can fly back and stay in Airbnbs and see them every other month. Uh, or I can fly them down to, in the winter to live with me. So we, or, you know, rent an Airbnb for them. So we have to think out of the box uh, about, and I personally realized that I was spending, you know, my wife and I were spending three times too much on housing, living in Boston. We moved to Providence during COVID. We bought uh, a house that uh, was a third as, as expensive per square foot. Uh, and yeah, the, and the fourth uh, really uh, point about economic space planning is uh, understanding your living standard risk from investing at risk. So if you, uh, what economics says is that as your, as the, investments you have go up and down, you want to adjust your spending. So you want to see, okay, this year I did well, I'm going to spend a little bit more. This year I did poorly, I spent less. And so you want to track, and the, the, the book talks about how to do this again with algebra, uh, with high school, high school math, at the arithmetic, not even algebra, high school arithmetic, how you can tra track these trajectories of your living standard, see the ups and downs to your living standard, and see if that's too risky for you. If it is, invest in something that's less risky or spend less aggressively along the way because the ultimate downside if you've spent a whole lot up you know up to your 80s and now the stock market which on which you've been depending tanks dramatically you're going to suffer a big decline so you want to see what aggressive spending and aggressive investing implies and maybe adjust and uh, again the book does that and the software helps too you know, interestingly, I think that the word risk has run like a thread through this conversation in, in ways right. that we don't right. often talk about it, right? We talk about investment risk a lot, but right. but we don't talk about these other risks. Um, can you spend a few minutes just talking about, are, are there several other risks that we need to be paying attention to right now? And, and what are the best ways that we can manage for them? Well, there's, you know, risk of uh, uh, job loss and uh, needing to uh, automate, being autom autom automatized by a robot. So many jobs I heard just yesterday talking to uh, ENT about uh, 
audiologists are going to be put out of business because they're going to be selling hearing aids at CVS over the counter. The FDA is going to approve that trip. So you have to think before you strike down an occupation, will it be there? Uh, or will this particular job that, I'm, that I've chosen uh, maybe at um, a particular company, are there any gray hairs? Are there people that look like me uh, there? Or has everybody, uh, you know, so maybe there's no long, real longevity of this job because they've somehow forced older people out the door because they can hire younger people to replace them. Uh, you want to think about um, uh, uh, clearly uh, retiring too early is a huge risk. Mm -hmm. You could end up living longer than you worked. That's an enormous risk. You want to be sure that you don't convince yourself be, uh, like Wall Street would like you to convince yourself that you're going to die on time in your life expectancy because longevity risk, uh, you know, yeah, is, is enormous. But focusing on life expectancy as opposed to the worst case scenario that you live to your maximum age of life and it's worst case financially speaking because you have to keep paying for yourself, an, another huge risk. So uh, healthcare risk, having to live in a, you know, in a, uh, you know, home healthcare center uh, and maybe retaining some funds to and then also ultimately maybe going on to Medicaid. Well, I saw with my our two parents that um, if you pay privately for a couple of years, uh, facilities will often transit you onto Medicaid so that having some funds, maybe that trapped equity in your home is actually going to be uh, a, a support blanket for getting you into a nice, uh, uh, you know, uh, home health care system. Uh, uh, or nursing home or a home health care facility that will then take put you onto Medicaid and pay for you that way after a couple of years. So, yeah, all this stuff is um, risk we have to think about out there. And it's hard to contemplate. It's it's uh, uh, an off the, the general path outcome. Uh, and but we have to be worried about that. Too. And that's why we buy home homeowners insurance and life insur insurance and uh, health insurance, uh, automobile insurance, long, longevity mm -hmm. insurance, we're not buying, as you're saying. We're not buying enough annuity insurance. We're not figuring, we're not. Why do you think that is, Larry? I mean, all the economists that I have spoken to yeah. seem to be proponents of annuities, but very few Americans use them to protect themselves. Yeah, just, from why saying, why is that? I mean, so it's crazy, the easiest annuity to buy, which is all you just have to do is just sit there and wait for eight years to take your benefit, your retirement benefit. It'll be 76% higher. Now, it's not optimal for everybody to do that, but for about 85% is optimal. Only 6% are doing this because they've gotten themselves convinced. Uh, I think there's a couple things, maybe. Wall Street is pushing people to think about life expectancy so that they can take Social Security early so that they can keep the people will leave their retirement account money with uh, Wall Street, so Wall Street can keep charging fees. So part of this is not benign. Part of this is Wall Street. Uh, part of this is um, uh, that you don't want to think about living to your max major life because you're worried you're going to jinx yourself and die the next minute. So I think part of it's psychological. Uh, part of it is people don't care enough about their future selves. They they are kind of uh, current oriented, but they think the future self, what have that, what is that person who's going to be around in 20 years done for me? What are they going to do for me? Nothing. Why should I care about them? Well, you have to care about them. You're the fiduciary of your future self. You're the parent of your future self. So you have to be careful uh, with that future um, person. You have to take care of that person, save for that person. So I think there's all these things that are involved that uh, are leading people to just avoid uh, uh but everybody, you know, a lot of people are living to a very, very old age. My yeah. mom is an example. Uh, uh, your mom's an example, I think. Uh, so we, I think that the probability of a couple, one person living be into their 90s is at least 25%. So I, a real thing. Yeah. No, I know. I, I'm going to take that that saying, you're the fiduciary of your future self, and I'm going to put it on a T-shirt. Um, Larry <laughs> Kotlikoff book is Money Magic. Thank you so much for, for doing this with me today. I uh, I hope that you'll come back. Julia um, Moses Johnson just asked for your name again and, and uh, the name of the book. So again, it's Larry Kotlikoff. Um, the book is Money Magic. Larry, where can we find more about you? 
I would say uh, my web, my main website is kotlikoff.net, and I write on lots of different topics beyond personal finance. I write about climate change and banking reform and uh, healthcare reform. Um, so I'm I'm old enough to have worked on lots of issues. So I, and I enjoy economics and I keep at it. So. And you can also find more about Larry at our website, which is protectedincome.org slash Kotlikoff, K-O-T-L-I-K-O-F-F. -F. And Julia, I will say goodbye to Larry and I will put it right up on the screen for you. So Larry, thank you so much again for doing this today. Um, sure, I hope you'll come back and I hope you all will visit our website for more information. Again, protectedincome.org slash Kotlikoff. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Jean.